<laughs> just started so i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna start again so yeah hey uh i'm excited to be presenting on the, my research on biological shape analysis where i extract the shapes of biological structures from images so on the screen for example you have uh, images of cells that are actually cancer cells recorded by fluorescence microscopy and typically in my research i'm interested in quantifying the shapes of this biological structure and for this, I contribute to a field of machine learning called geometric learning that I also implement in an open source software called GeomStats, actually stands for geometric statistics, not only geometric machine learning, but also geometric statistics. Uh, and that this software can be applied beyond shape analysis, even though I use it and I started it uh, motivated by shape analysis. So today I'm going to present uh, a little bit on how and why we want to do biological shape analysis from biomedical images, and then how geometric learning comes in and what's implemented in this software so that if you want to use it for your own research, hopefully you will understand how to get started. Okay, but let's first uh, motivate this a little bit. Um, the overarching goal of this research is to make advances in biomedical research. So what's the goal of biomedical research? Um, some of the goals of biomedical research is to describe and quantify the fundamental mechanisms of life. For example, to be able to have a better understanding of diseases, have a better diagnosis of diseases, and hopefully better treatment. And today, to understand these fundamental mechanisms of life that make the biology, we're actually very lucky because we have access to a wide range of biological and medical images across the scales. So I mean from the macroscopic scale to the nanoscopic scale. And all of these new imaging modalities, new way of imaging the living, have allowed us to observe biological structures in action. So what do I mean by biological structure? It could be organs, tissues, cells, organelles of molecule, or molecules. So now in order to understand what's going on in organisms, we can look at them. So for example, at the macroscopic scale, we have access to some imaging modalities that are called, uh, for example, magnetic resonance imaging. That would be one imaging modality to look at biological structure at the macroscopic scale. But actually, all the way down to the nanoscopic scale, today we have access to other imaging modalities. And at the nanoscopic scale, we can observe using cryo-electron microscopy, for example. And the point I want to make in this talk and in my research more generally is that across all of these images of biological structures, there is one feature that matters. And this feature is the shape the shape of the biological structures that are being imaged. Let me give you some examples of why shapes are important. And for these examples, I'm going to use Alzheimer's disease as the uh, leading uh, disease of interest. So I'm going to show you that Alzheimer's disease is a same problem, shape problem across scales. Let's start with the macroscopic scale. What you have on the screen is a simulation of, but that is close to reality as confirmed by clinician, a simulation of an aging brain of someone who has Alzheimer's disease. And you may notice that there are shape changes here. So at the center, so this is a 3D brain, you see three cuts of it. You may see that this black area here grow. These are the ventricles of the brain. And they grow because the white mitre around them is shrinking. We call, that, call this the atrophy of the brain. And actually, when we're aging, all of our brains shrink like this, uh, undergo atrophy. But when it's Alzheimer's disease, this atrophy is accelerated. And so at the macroscopic scale, Alzheimer's disease is correlated or can be observed by looking at brain shape changes. So Alzheimer's disease is a shape situation at the macroscopic scale. Now, at the mesoscopic scale too, this is what's happening. Because, I mean, we have said that the white matter is shrinking, but at the, mesoscope, at the microscopic scale, 
this is what is happening to the neurons. The neurons are actually dying, and as they die, as they die, they retract their axons and dendrites and change in shape. So if you were to want to diagnose Alzheimer's at the microscopic scale, the scale of the cells, you would see the neurons dying, and as they die, changing shape. So at the microscopic scale too, Alzheimer's can be correlated with shape changes of cells in that case. But also at the nanoscopic scale, so at the scale of proteins, Alzheimer's is also a shape problem because you have these two proteins called beta amylo E and tau that are changing shape. And because they change shape, they aggregate inside the neurons, so in blue, and outside the neurons. And this is actually what's leading to the death of these neurons who change shape and then create this atrophy of the brain who also change shape. So we have a, a cascade of shape effect through the scales um, that can be correlated with Alzheimer's disease. So we have established that um, shapes, biological shapes, are related to physiological function. If we think of this from a biophysics perspective, if a biological structure changes state from a healthy state to a pathological state, then it's, it is likely to change shapes. And we can maybe explain that with a cascade of causes that will be described by the biophysics. Now, what I'm interested in doing in, the, in my research is inverting that model. I do not know exactly what is the biophysics that goes from the protein changing shapes in Alzheimer's disease to eventually what we observe at the scale of the brain. But I want to try to invert the model by doing statistics mostly and machine learning. So that's why I call it geometric learning. In this case, the data points are shapes. And given statistics or machine learning applied to these shapes, I would like to extract some type of biological insights. So this is going to be um, the outline of the talk, not that we have motivated that we want to do statistics on shapes and, for example, biological shapes. I'm going to, in the first section, explain how we model shape data in a computer. So for humans and our visual systems, we can verify, distinguish a shape for another, from another. Uh, but how do you implement the notion of shape in a computer? There could be different way of implementing models of shapes. So I'm going to explain or present uh, some models of shape uh, that we can use to uh, co actually compute on, on, the, on the biological shape. But you have on the top left, uh, is a sphere, which is the data space of triangles. <laughs> no problem. But what, I'm, what we're going to see is that these shape data are going to be elements of data spaces that are actually curved and that are called manifold. Uh, in the second section, I'm going to present the software whose development I'm co-leading. Uh, it's a software called GeomStats that stands for geometric statistics. It's open source. It provides method to do statistics and machine learning on shape data, but also more generally on any type of data that belong to manifolds, which are these nonlinear generation of vector spaces. So I started the software in order to fulfill a goal to do analysis of shapes, but now it's become more abstract and you can do a statistical analysis on data points that are not necessarily representing shapes. Uh, and then in section three, I'll talk about geometric learning for shape analysis, which means really presenting a use case of uh, biomedical research, which would be the example of these uh, cells and how we can describe the shape of these cells. In that case, it is a cancer cell. How I can correlate the shape of the cancer cell with different treatment drugs that have been applied to the cells. Any questions? So far, feel free to interrupt me anytime, by the way. Great. OK, so let me explain or present the mathematical models and computational models of shapes. Not all of them, two of them. So how can we model shape and or shape transformation? The first one, first way of modeling shape is by thinking of what makes a shape 
or more precisely, what does not change a shape. So on this slide, you have um, a closed curve, which is actually the boundary of a cancer cell, which is extracted from the data set that we're going to use in section three. Um, and you might be thinking, okay, how can I describe the shape of this cancer cell? In other words, the shape of the, this closed curve. And you can say, well, the shape is everything that remains invariant when I translate, rotate, rescale, or reparameterize the uh, cell. Because if, I, if the, the camera or the microscope that is being used to record that cell was positioned slightly differently, well, that does not change the biology. So translation doesn't matter. If the zoom or how close the microscope was, uh, it should not, it should not change the biology. So I want to be, I want to characterize shapes independent of the scaling. Same thing for the rotation. And the last one is a bit more subtle. The last one is the reparameterization. So you can see that now there are some sampling points along the boundary of this cell. Maybe this cell boundary has been computed as the result of a segmentation. And this segmentation procedure does it in a certain way and maybe it's going to put way more points to describe that area of the cell than another one in any way how the points are sampled around the boundary of that cell is not physically relevant just the result of the segmentation and so this does not uh this should not impact our representation of shape you can see the sampling here slightly moving. okay so in this first model of shape we define a shape as all the characteristics of an object, the coordinates of the sampling point around this curve, for example, will be the object, all the characteristics of the objects that remain unchanged by translation, rotation, scaling, and reparameterization. In mathematics, we say that the shape is an equivalence class. The shape is represented by all the objects that have the same shape. So all the objects that can be obtained that are equivalent by a transformation corresponding to a translation, scaling, rotation, and reparameterization. We can express that in using uh, more mathematics and specifically using uh, the concept of Lie group. So what you have written here, G is zero, it's a Lie group. It represents a group of transformation. So all translation, rotation, scaling, and reparameterization are represented by this group of all possible transformations that do not change the shape. The way a transformation acts on an object is traditionally represented by this abstract notation. G0 is one translation. It is acting on the coordinates of the sampling point to give another boundary. And so in that um, framework, we represent a shape as with this notation, so bracket of X, X will be the object, bracket of X, the shape of X. So what is the shape of X? Ah, here. The shape of X is all the other objects or all the possible objects that can be obtained from X just by one transformation that belongs to this group of transformation. So all the, the shape of X, all the objects such that there exists a transformation within the group of transformation such that this object can be obtained by the transform of X. One shape is an element of a, is a Nicolas class. We say it's an element of a quotient space. Okay, that's the first model of shape. The one that's, that is on the left of that screen. Second model of shape. It's actually a model of shape deformation, but we use the deformation to represent the shape itself. So let me show you how that works. For the second model of shape, so the one that is on the right of the screen, we fix one shape. For example, this peanut looking cell is a shape that we fix. And then we represent any other shape in the data set by the smooth transformation that is needed to obtain the shape of the data set from the template shape. So in this case, the template shape is this peanut uh, cell shape. And let's say the element of the data set is this one, this um, other cell shape. 
how can I represent this cell shape in a computer? I'm going to represent it by the transformation I need to deform the peanut onto that cell. So the peanut is called the template shape or template cell, and all the other cells are represented by the deformation needed from this template cell. It's usually a smooth deformation, so something that would be like this. Now, what's interesting in that case, if you want to put the math there too, is that we're using similar concepts. Uh, the similar concept that we are using is the concept of Lie group, a set of transformations that have certain property. So the concept we're going to use is a Lie group again, represented by this notation G. It's again a group of transformations. It also can act on the original object X. Here, here X is all the coordinates of all the sampling points along the cell boundary. And I can use a smooth transformation to deform that. So I also have this notation here. But the big, big difference with the case that is on the left is that on the right here, G is the group of smooth deformation. On the left, G0 was translation, rotation, scaling, and reparametrization. So on the left, G0 was representing everything that does not affect the shape, whereas on the right, G represents the shape. On the left, we want to forget everything that relates to G0. On the right, we use G to represent the shape itself. So for the model that is on the right, oh, there is a question. Let me see if I can get it. Why are they Lie groups and not groups in general? Yeah, uh, great question. So a uh, Lie group is a group that is also a manifold. So it's a, it's a set that is a group such that uh, that set is continuous and even smooth. So typically, an example of a group that wouldn't be a Lie group would be um, a group of discrete rotation. For example, all the rotation of angles uh, 90 degrees, uh, 180, uh, 270, etc. So you would have four elements in that group, the four uh, rotations. That will be that is a discrete group. It's not a Lie group. On the other hand, if you look at all the 2D rotation, where the angle is not necessarily 90, 180, etc., but all the possible angle, the angle varies continuously, that that will be a Lie group because it has a smooth structure. So a Lie group is a topological space called the manifold with a smooth structure that is also a group. Does that answer the question more or less? Thank you. Um, so yeah, that's why they are Lie groups. So in both uh, models of shape, we have Lie groups. On the left, Lie group is the space of transformation that we don't care about because they don't change the shape. On the right, the Lie group represents the transformation that we do change, that do change the shape and that we care about. Now, from a machine learning perspective, there is something that's very interesting across these two models of shapes is that in both cases, our data are elements of data spaces that are a bit original. On the right, the data space is a quotient space. So we can slightly forget the mathematical definition that I have. Let's say it's an exotic data space. On the right, the shapes are elements of the Lie group directly, the Lie group of smooth deformation. These two data spaces have something in common. They are both manifolds with additional geometric structures. So, what does it mean? I'm going to define in a second what is a manifold. Uh, but it's something that is common to these two models of shapes, which means that if we know how to do statistics and machine learning on manifold, then we can apply all of these techniques to these two models of shapes. And even further, actually manifolds can represent, can be data spaces of data that are way beyond shapes. So covariance matrices are elements of manifold. Um, here, like trees can be modeled as elements of manifold, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a more general motivation uh, to define statistics on manifolds. OK, but what are manifolds? Uh, so we have established that shape spaces are manifolds. 
or more precisely, I've told you that in both models of shapes, the data spaces that are the shape spaces are manifold. What is a manifold? A manifold is a space that is a nonlinear generalization of a linear space or a vector space. So linear space, for example, the linear plane. Here, what you have on the screen would be an example of manifold. So the surface of that sphere, sphere is an example of manifold because it's nonlinear, it's curved. It's a two-dimensional curved space. And actually, the sphere that you have on that screen, it's a bit more than a sphere. Uh, you see that I superimpose triangles on, uh, on the grid, let's say, uh, on the sphere. And actually, this, the sphere is a model of the shape space of triangles. So if you're interested in why that is the case, there is a nice mathematical proof by Kendall. Uh, but you can show that the space of triangles as defined by the definition that I have on the that I had on the left before, so with the question space, the shape space of triangles is actually a sphere, which is uh, manifold because it's a nonlinear generalization of a vector space. So a low-dimensional example of manifold would be the data space of the shapes of 2D triangles, which is literally a sphere. But in the other example of shape spaces that we could be interested in shapes of curves, shapes of surfaces, shapes of not only long, three landmarks, but maybe pentagons. Uh, they would use hypersphere at some point, and therefore they're also uh, manifold. So what we are interested in, in this context, is to be able to compute with data points that live in this data space, so that are elements on, of this manifold. Let's say I have a data set of triangles, then this would be the data points put on this sphere. And I want to be able to do statistics on this sphere. So why can't we use traditional statistics, right? Because statistics and machine learning have been around for uh, quite some time now. And it's uh, also a very uh, flourishing uh, research area. So why is it that the statistics and machine learning methods that are available are not suited to do statistics or machine learning on shapes. So this is a toy example that illustrates that fact. Imagine I want to compute the mean shape of two triangles. I have one triangle, two triangles. I want to say, okay, what is the mean of these two triangles in terms of sh their shapes? Now we have said that the sphere is the data space of triangle. So this blue point will represent my first triangle and this triangle of shape and this second blue point would represent my second triangle shape. If I apply traditional statistics, traditional statistics would tell me that the mean of these two triangle shapes is this orange point, right? It's the middle of the two points. Uh, but now this orange point does not belong to the surface of the sphere. This means that the mean of two triangle or shapes is not gonna be a triangle, which is somewhat problematic. So I cannot directly use traditional statistics and machine learning. I need to be able to say, if I compute the mean of two triangular shapes, I want it to be a triangular shape. So we justify that we want to have a theory of statistics and more generally machine learning that can do all of the computations on the surface of this sphere. In that case, we would generalize the definition of mean in order to get that result. So we would say, the mean of these two triangles is the point that is at the middle of this curve, which is called a geodesic, joining the two points on the surface of the shape space. Now, I've explained this concept using the sphere as the manifold, but of course that applies to, you know, way higher dimensional manifolds, manifolds are a bit more abstract than just using uh, the sphere. Before I go in the next step, maybe I'll address one potential interrogation that you could have at this point, which is what about we use traditional statistics and we compute this orange point and then we just project it back to the sphere. And then in that case, we do have some, like the projection of the linear mean that belongs to the space and we're good. Uh, there are different problems with this type of approach. The first one is, here, I, I show you a sphere, which is a two-dimensional manifold. 
as embedded in three-dimensional linear space because there exists an embedding of the 2D sphere into the 3D vector space. Actually, for any manifold, there exists an embedding in a higher dimensional vector space, uh, but it's not always possible to compute that embedding. The proof showing that every manifold can be included in a higher dimensional space is not constructed. And so I wouldn't be able to use these statistics in the first place because I wouldn't be able to embed my manifold into something that would be higher dimensional. That's the first problem. The second problem, let's assume I can embed the manifold in a higher dimensional space constructively, so I can do it in the code. Uh, I'm still increasing the dimension of the data. And usually in machine learning, we rather want to reduce the dimension of the data uh, for compute and memory uh, uh, optimization. So here, if I have statistics that allow me to compute directly on the surface of the sphere, I only need two degrees of freedom describe any point in the surface of that sphere. If I embed the sphere in 3D vector space, now I need three coordinates to represent each point. So in that toy example, it's just one more coordinate. So the loss is not that much, but you can imagine if you had to double the dimension of your data each time you want to do that, we feel that it's not the most elegant method at least. So we are interested in doing statistics for data that belong to manifold, which are these curved spaces that, for example, represent shape spaces. Um, and so to do this, uh, I've been focusing on developing both the theory of what I call geometric learning, which is the extension of machine learning on these curved spaces, uh, the theory, but also the implementation, uh, which is gathered in a package called GeomStats, which stands for geometric statistics, and which I'm going to present next. Uh, but before I do, do you have any questions on the how we represent shapes in a computer and why the shape space uh, also has a weird shape because it's non-linear? Yeah, so the word geometry and shape each time can be understood in different ways, right? There is one point on this space is a shape, but if I can if I consider the shape, the the space itself, it has a shape because it's a sphere. So sometimes I use the word shape and geometry. Uh, I should precise if I mean the, sh the geometry of the shape or the geometry of the shape space. But I'll, I'll try to make it precise if I encounter that. OK, so let me present the implementation of this theory and practice of uh, geometric uh, learning into GeomSats. So GeomSats is an open source software that has been created with three objectives that I mentioned in the workshop this morning, but I'm going to repeat. Um, the first objective is to teach hands-on geometric learning. So why is that? Uh, it's because in order to do geometric learning, we need to be able to describe the data space, which is this manifold. And this is done using notions of quotient spaces, Lie group, Lie group action, transformation, that are well described using differential geometry or Riemannian geometry. Now, differential geometry is a mathematical theory that is often presented in theoretical textbooks, which is good uh, from a mathematical perspective. But as an engineer, sometimes it's harder to grasp uh, what is in these textbooks. So GeomStacks, the first objective of GeomStacks is to be able to give a platform that allows to teach differential geometry, but with a hands-on approach by showing the code that corresponds to the question space, the code that corresponds to the league. What is a manifold? Well, maybe if I see it implemented, I'll have a better understanding of what is the manifold. So this is taken from one of my classes when I, where I teach differential geometry using Jupyter notebooks. So I explain the concept of manifolds to the class using the code. The second objective of the software is to support research in geometric learning. So there, there are actually a lot of algorithms out there to compute for data that belong to manifolds. Uh, but often they had been uh, published, let's say, by mathematicians or applied mathematicians that have a very precise understanding of the theory. But if I come as an engineer and read this code, it's going to be way too abstract for me to understand it and use it. 
which is both bad for me because I'm missing out on an opportunity to use a new algorithm that will be good for my research, but also for the mathematician that has developed it, because while it could be useful, it is not actually used. So in that sense, GeomSat acts as a platform where mathematicians and applied mathematicians contribute their code. And when they contribute their code, of course, they reference their papers. And we force them to put it in a way that we think is going to be understandable by uh, engineers, basically hiding mathematical details into some functions such that engineers or scientists, applied scientists, can use the concept without needing to understand all the state-by-state -state details. And now that's good for uh, the contributors because their papers is cited here, so it has more visibility thanks to the platform, uh, but also it's going to be more used because it's easier to use so that the contributor is going to get more citations on average if they contribute their method to the package. It's also good for the user because it's easier to use. Uh, so yeah, it's a way of supporting research and geometric learning by showcasing all these great algorithms and making them easier to use. And the last one is more the user side, uh, democratize the use of geometric learning, which is tied to what I said uh, just before, but taking the user perspective this time. If the algorithm are well coded, well tested, integrated into GM stats, then as a user with no particular background in differential geometry, say, it's going to be easier for me to use that. So in terms of the software, uh, GMSTAT is split into two main modules, called one called geometry and one called learning. I won't mention the third one, which is information geometry for that talk, but you're welcome to go explore on GitHub if you wish. The geometry is the module that implements the manifold. What are the data spaces that we're interested in? So for example, I'm going to have the manifold of triangle. I'm going to have the manifold of rotations, the manifold of rotations and translations. This is implemented in a geometry part, part, which is an implementation of differential geometry. And then learning is the module that you could think of as an equivalent of scikit-learn, which is a machine learning Python software, but for data that belong to these data spaces that have now an exotic geometry. We also have a data sets module that provides open source data set that live on this manifold so that if you want to contribute a new algorithm, you have actual data to test it on. A visualization module too. Um, Jumpstart also comes in four backends. So all the computations work for NumPy, TensorFlow, PyTorch, and Autograd. Special mention to uh, TensorFlow, Torch, and Autograd that are backends that provide automatic differentiation. Now, the mathematical theory that is implemented in there is called differential geometry. And so just because the word differential is there, uh, you might guess from that word that automatic differentiation might be very useful to implement this mathematical theory, and it actually is. Um, so typically, if you want to use GeomStats to do geometric learning on data that live on the, your manifold, you would process in two steps. The first step is the step that is different from your traditional scikit-learn algorithm. You will need to say, which, what is your data space? What is the geometry of the data space on which your data points uh, lie? In scikit-learn, you don't need to do that because points are assumed to be elements on a vector space. So it's going to be a vector space. You give an array of, let's 10, the data space is R10. So you can in space of dimension 10. Here, the first step needs to introduce what is the geometry of the data space. And the second step is the step that's equivalent to scikit-learn. And as a matter of fact, GM stats, the package follows scikit-learn API in order to be easier in order for it to be easily used uh, by people who know uh, scikit learn. So you would typically um, instantiate your learning algorithm. Here's just the algorithm that learns or estimate the Fréchet mean, the generalization of mean for manifolds. You tell it which geometry you're interested in, and then you just proceed as if you were in scikit learn. Now, there are related libraries. Uh, that do computations on manifolds, it's not only uh, GM stats, but they have different goals. So for example, the first three 
perform optimization on manifold. So they want to do, a, let's say, a gradient descent, descent, and they want to find the point that optimizes a certain criteria that point belongs to a manifold. We do not do optimization, we do machine learning. Uh, you have Python geometric, which has the term geometric in it. It's mostly deep learning on graphs. Piano geometry and Jack geometry are actually the same package, but re-implemented in Jacks uh, as Tiano became less maintained. And this is for stochastics on manifolds. And then you have the second half of this table where it's statistics and learning on manifolds, but on special manifolds. So for example, these two, uh, Pi Riemann and I learn, it's geometric statistics, points belonging to a curved data space. But the curved data space of consideration is only the data space of symmetric, positive, definite matrices. So all geometric statistics and geometric learning, but for that manifold in particular. The next one would be Pi Quaternion. It's geometric statistics and learning, but for the manifold of 3D rotations only. This one, these two H2 surface mesh and SR and F match code are dedicated to do statistics on shapes of surfaces. Also, they're restricted in the data spaces and type of data that they're looking at. And the last one, Sage Math, which has a manifold module, is used in uh, general activity. So a lot of the manifolds are implemented there are manifold at Rublin's space time or the geometry of space time next to black holes, for example. So complementary goals, uh, but by comparison, we do geometric statistics and learning on a, a, general, a more general class of manifold. We are less in the application, we're more on the implementing from a numerical perspective, the theory of differential geometry and statistics on the subjects. Okay. So now, how can we generalize these statistics? Uh, I explained that the GeomStat does that, but how do we do in practice to take the theory of statistics and machine learning that has been defined on vector spaces and make it work on discrete spaces that are manifold? I'm going to present two perspectives to answer that question. The first one is the user perspective. Meaning it's everything you need to know to be able to use and roughly understand what is in GM stats. And then I'll go to the what I call the contributor perspective, which is slightly more in depth, but not too long, uh, explaining how differential geometry is implemented in practice in the library. Okay, but from a user perspective, GM stats user perspective, what do we need to know to understand what's going on in the package and therefore what's going on in geometric statistics and learning. So we can abstract a little bit what has been done in research in statistics and machine learning and think about the fact that most of the algorithms of machine learning, most of algorithms probably, uh, rely on specific elementary operation. So if you think about an, a, pro, a computer program as a language, you have specific words that come up many times. So for example, points, and vectors, like a point, what is point in a vector space or a fine space and a vector in a vector space. These are elementary building blocks of what make an algorithm in this field. The notion of computing inner products between two vectors is also some operation that we do many times in this type of algorithm. Computing the distance between two points is an elementary operation too. The notion of straight line between two points, think straight line, line, linear regression, is an elementary operation. And addition and subtraction are also two very important basic operations. By addition, I mean adding a vector to a point to get another point. And by subtraction, I mean subtracting two points to get a vector. So if we were to abstract a lot of algorithms in the field, we would see that a lot of them rely on these basic building blocks, which give us a strategy to generalize statistics. Because if, one can, if we can generalize these building blocks, or if we can translate them to stay in the language analogy, then we can translate any machine learning algorithm to make them work on manifold. And so that's basically 
everything we need to know as a users is which operation that looks complicated, but uh, to which operation it corresponds to in the traditional vector space. So in a vector space, we had points like these points in blue and vector like this vector in black. Now on the manifold, such as the sphere, we still have points, points on the curved space, but we don't have a notion of vector anymore. Now vectors are a bit more complicated. They are tangent vector, such as this black arrow. And the difference is now the vectors or tangent vectors are attached to a point. I can only talk about a tangent vector by specifying to which point it belongs. So it's a bit more complicated. On a vector space, we have a notion of inner product. allows us, for example, to compute angles or distance or norms um, of vectors. On a manifold, we have a notion of metric, so-called a Riemannian metric, if it satisfies certain property, which is basically a collection of inner products on each of the possible tangent spaces of the manifold. So in the vector space, we have one inner product. On the manifold, we have as many inner products as we have tangent spaces on the manifold, so as many inner products as we have points. On the uh, vector space, we have a notion of distance. We can compute distances between two points. On the manifold, this is going to call it, be called the geodesic distance. It will be the length of this curve connecting the two points. On the vector space, we have a notion of straight line, which is the curve of shortened length connecting two points. This is translated into a notion of geodesic on the manifold. And now the addition of a vector to a point becomes the exponential map of a tangent vector to a point. Vector added to a point gives another point. This tangent vector in black added to this blue point gives the orange point. On the vector space, we can subtract two points to get a vector, subtract these two blue points to get a vector. On the manifold, we can subtract the two points here to get a tangent vector, which is what is the velocity at which we should shoot from the blue point to be able to reach the orange point. I haven't explained how we compute the geodesic, how we do the minimization, how we implement the exponential map, et cetera, because I just want to emphasize this translation operation so that if you see a Riemannian X map in an algorithm, you can think of it as an addition of a vector to a point. And this gives you a coarse understanding at least of what's, what's going on, which is translation view. And so in the code too, if you know what is x, what is log, what is geodesic, then you can use geom stats just by recognizing these keywords. So the way the geodesic is implemented is done in the core library, the, the core code base. But it's enough for you to know, the ge to know that the geodesic is a generalization of a straight line to be able to call it. So let's say you want to compute the geodesic linking the blue point to the orange point, that is the equivalent of the straight line that would link the blue point to the orange point, uh, then you, you can call the uh, geodesic function. If you want to add the tangent vector in black to the blue point, actually it's Paris, if the sphere is the earth, uh, then you can call the x. And similarly, you can compute which tangent vector you would need to reach the orange point from the blue point. And so you use the log. So I've, shown most of these examples on the sphere because it's a most well-known example of manifold and it's easy to visualize but let me show you a little bit how you would use that to do computation on shapes and specifically on the two models of shape space that i had introduced before so the model of quotient space which is we quotient meaning we remove translation scaling rotation and reparameterization we remove everything that does not change the shape and then the model of Lie group, the shapes described as a transformation. So here, not really knowing how the geodesic is implemented, but just using my user perspective, let's say I want to compute the shortest curve on the shape space, meaning the geodesic that links two shapes. So the blue point is a cell shape. The orange point is a cell shape. I want to compute the trajectory 
trajectory on the shape manifold that links the two cell shapes, then I can do exactly this. I instantiate the geometry of the shape space that I'm interested in using. Here is the shape space of discrete curve in R2, so discrete curves in 2D. I take the metric that is embedded in that space to be able to run computations. And if I want the trajectory that links one cell shape to the other, I can use the geodesic operation from cell shape I to cell shape J. That's going to give me a path in the shape space. This path can be discretized into all of these gray shapes. And here, what you see on the right is the geodesic in the shape space that has been discretized. So you see all the gray cells are all the points along that path in these cell shapes. So that's an example in the quotient space case. In the Lie group case, uh, well, here I take a special Lie group. I consider Lie group of uh, rotation and translations. Uh, but here, uh, this is a geodesic in the Lie group of translation and rotation in C3. I actually am going to speed up a little bit. I'm not going to present the contributor perspective here. I'm just going to give you the overview of what exists in terms of geometry in uh, GM stats. So we use an object-oriented programming approach, meaning that all of the data spaces that have these specific geometries are represented as Python class. So each box is a Python class. Uh, and you see that these boxes are organized into a hierarchy, while at the top of the hierarchy, you have the most abstract representation of data space that we think of. In our case, it's the manifold. But if you go down the hierarchy, you start answering the question, which manifold am I really considering? So for example, here it's a manifold. Oh, there was a question on Lie group before. A Lie group is a manifold that is also a group. Therefore, a Lie group is a special case of manifold. And therefore, from an object-oriented perspective, a Lie group is a child class of the Python class manifold. Matrix Lie group, I can go down the hierarchy. I see a special Euclidean here. This is a special type of matrix Lie group. It's a matrix Lie group of rotations and translations. And you have other more exotic manifolds there that you can use for one of the other applications. From So I was showing you kind of a toy representation of the geometry that is implemented in GMStats. Uh, but you, actually, you can actually run this tool called Calatrava to show what is the hierarchy of the geometry that is now implemented in GMStats. So that has been run on the database. And you can see it's the same hierarchy, just with more details. Where at the top, I have the data structure manifold. I even have a bit more information of what the manifold does. Manifold has a dimension, has a shape. Uh, but here, what you can see is a numerical organization of this field of mass called differential geometry. And so I call that a numerical differential geometry. And the goal of my research uh, in this case is not only to implement this mathematical theory in the computer, uh, but also find ways of doing statistics on it. And so therefore, I often say that my goal is to fill out this table, where in this table on the different lines or different rows, you have different geometry that can be used to describe your space. It can be a Riemannian manifold, it can be a pseudo Riemannian manifold, it could be a Lie group. We talked about that one. And then for all of these different types of manifolds, how can I generalize all the, all the different fields of statistics and probability theory? What does it mean to do statistics on a Riemannian manifold? What does it mean to do statistics on a Lie group? And same questions for um, deep learning, machine learning, etc. So there's 10 minutes left i'm gonna conclude but i'd be happy to answer any question this is the bioshape lab at uc santa barbara and thank you very much for your attention yeah
Christian theology. I'm understanding that the shape will define life. Partially define, I guess, depends what you mean by define. Uh, so in biology, there is a fundamental biological assumption that yeah, shapes are correlated to function. Yeah. The, the, distinguishing life from what? Well, even in non-life, you can shapes can be important. Uh, for example, I don't know, like an architecture building, depending on the shape they have, they might hold against health elseways versus not. Uh, how, how do you explain how, how do you explain the geography of the level? The geography of the level is trying to define the level of the shore. And uh, simply you just draw a line from one to the other, or you look for more details. Yeah. And the more details you look at, the number changes. Yeah, 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 yeah. For example, yeah, the length of a shore, depending on the sampling, is going to be different because the more points you have. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. So you're doing the same thing here on the shape. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How do you, like, what do you define? What point do you say? Enough. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, but first of all, the length is questioned out. So this notion of size or this notion of scaling in the scale, in the uh, case of shapes is the length. So it's literally the length of the boundary, which is literally what you are uh, mentioning. And it's true that if I put more points along the boundary, this length is going to increase. Um, but at some point, I guess the change in length or size is not going to be as important as the noise that I have on my sampling points anyway. Because yes, I can add more sampling points and it's going to change the length of the third slightly. But these sampling points are the results of a segmentation algorithm that I have run on an image that had some noise. And so in the end, what's going to be the, the most important factor? The fact that I am in more points locally, the, since it's uh, smooth, locally it looks like a line, a little element of the boundary of the cell. So at some point, if I add more, more points, it's not going to change the uh, length too much. They're just going to divide that into a two. Just so going to change in when there is curvature. So at some point, that's going to plateau. The length is going to plateau. Um, and but what's going to change the length more is whether that point that has been given the sampling point on the boundary of the cell that has been given by the segmentation algorithm was given here instead of there, just because there was noise in the image. So that's going to be the prevailing factor. So I guess you only need that many sampling points to be precise enough up to the quality of the data that you'd be given originally. So it's the noise. Yeah. And how is that meaningful in terms of? How does it? Uh, sorry, can you repeat? Your introduction was uh, looking at cells. Yeah. Right? How, how does that noise relate to practically to find light from, say, uh, Yeah, so how does that mean? I mean, in practice, I even uh, explored that noise limit. In practice, I have a certain amount of sampling points, and I haven't changed that amount of sampling points too much, even though I agree it changed the length. But well, let me go very quickly over that case. Um, this, so I had a data set of cells, or more precisely, cell boundaries, sample with 200 sampling points. I didn't ask the question too much, like, should we double that or not? I want to understand if there is a difference in shapes between cell cancer cell shapes that have been treated with the drug uh, JAS, which is that, with these treatments. Is there a difference in the cancer cells that have received the treatment JAS and the cancer cells that have received the treatment CYTD? I want to know if there is a difference in these shapes. Why? Because the shape of a cell indicates the health of what's called actin, which is a family of 
protein that is involved in so many processes in the cells, including division, which is cell division, which is related to cancer. Cancer. So the shape of the cell is important to understand if a drug has had an effect on this actin. So what I want to know is if there are different in shapes. So I asked this question with a sampling points of 200, with 200 sampling points per cell. And I answered that question there. And we can see that there is a difference with this sampling, 200. Um, because, yeah, so that will be the one treated with JASP in orange here. And that will be the one treated with uh, CYTD in orange there. So I can see that there is a difference. Now, let's say I move from 200 points to 400 points. I think that I still gonna see a difference and that's everything that I need at this point to do this separation. And I don't, okay. I could have a number of sampling points that is so low that I don't see any difference. But as long as I can increase it and see a difference then I'm gonna be happy with that for the moment. But I agree that for Twitter or a more precise quantification of the phenomena, I'd be good to know how many. So you really know that you can do more than I didn't. Whatever you're looking for, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Oh, wait, there isn't one in the chat, I think, unless no, you. Okay. <laughs> Uh, no question. Oh, there is one question. Uh, Sorry, it shouldn't matter on the. So let me see if I understood the question correctly. Um, so you're saying the size of the cell is important in your case, uh, and you want to keep that? No, <laughs> sorry. I would say, so with the actual image of the cell, the amount of complexity you can see that for is significantly different than the amount of the experience. Yeah, 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 yeah. So even though, like, it's not the same amount, it's still experimentally added. Yes, I think it's also somewhat related maybe to the sampling, uh, like the resolution at which you can see the details on the boundary of the cell. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess it depends if you had different data sets, one in big massive magnification and the other one in small, I would do the analysis separately and not mix both. Uh, then if you have a data set with like different magnification, maybe I will just forget about this magnification effect, quotient it and compare everything. And yeah, great question, thanks. I do not see any questions online, so I think Let's start. I will speak about again. Thank you. Thank you.